Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yes, this is going to be a lightning session on uh, co correlation versus causality. I apologize, the session on measurement is uh, courtesy E4M, and it's in the second half, so I hope uh, you've had enough coffee, you're caffeinated, you'll be able to sit through the next 15 minutes. Um, so I head the India business for uh, a Publicis Epsilon. Epsilon was acquired by Publicis about uh, 2019. It was one of the biggest acquisitions after they acquired Sapient. So Sapient was the services arm that they acquired, and with the acquisition of Epsilon, Publicis is getting into the space of MarTech and uh, AdTech, so getting into the platform's play. Um, the reason uh, the E4M team uh, requested this session is because of a case study that we submitted with, uh, with them uh, on the work that we've done with Mama Earth, right? D to C, uh, incrementality, measurement, uh, and I would like to kick it off today uh, with an AV that showcases these sessions. So if I could have the AV played out, please. case study, that video, talked about a lot. It talked about data, it talked about incrementality, it talked about outcome, it talked about growth, it talked about dynamic creatives, it talked about personalization, individualization, one-to-one -one communication. Um, all of these are typically limited to uh, the CRM space, right? Personalization is where first-party data comes in. It's normally not talked about when it comes to programmatic um, media as a channel, paid media as, as an option. Uh, but what we have been able to do with Mama Earth is essentially leverage all of their first party data, going back all the way three years, and leverage that to drive incremental return and ad spend. So in the previous session, Gandhav talked about, he wrapped up the session with a very, very important statement. He said it's all about growth. It's all about outcomes for your clients, right? And that's exactly what the focus of our conversation today is. So while we typically talk about three pillars to whatever Epsilon does, doesn't matter if it's on the MarTech side or on the ad tech side, it's about understanding the customer, 
identification, therefore. Second is resonating with the customer, so personalization, one-to-one -one communication with the customer. And lastly is proving the outcome, proving the results, and definitely proving the, the results. Today, instead of covering all of the other pillars and all of the other sort of um, three-letter acronyms, we're going to focus on incrementality. We're going to focus on measurement. Right. Um, I decided to you know, start the session with um, correlation and causality. Right? These are the two terms that are fairly misunderstood as far as measurement in, in programmatic is concerned. I had a good time researching uh, the content for this slide. So what are we seeing on the slide? Two metrics, or two analysis, right? Divorce rate in the state of Maine, and per capita consumption of margarine. So if you look at this graph, and you just look at the numbers as is, the trend line as is, what are we saying? Increased per capita consumption in margarine or butter leads to a higher divorce rate? No, right? And vice versa, what is the relationship between divorce rates and, and butter consumption? There is no causal relationship between the two, right? There is a correlation. There is a positive coefficient of correlation. Uh, but there is no causal relationship between the two. And this is essentially the problem that we face in marketing analytics today, right? When it comes to programmatic, we start from the right-hand side. If you look at that slide, right? It's attribution, right? We are going with correlation. I or my channel has been in the path to conversion. Therefore, I'm attributed or I'm giving credit for that particular conversion. But what we're trying to move to, and this is especially important in uh, the context of you know, first party um, cookie base, uh, first party solutions, third party cookie deprecation, device ID deprecation potentially, is incrementality. You need more advanced models when it comes to measurement. So, on the right-hand side, you're basically saying, I need to just get in front of as many uh, conversions that are already going to happen, right? I just need to take credit for those conversions. On the left-hand side, we're saying, let's actually run experiments, scientific experiments, that tell us what would have happened any which way, what was the baseline going to be any which way without any intervention, without any personalization, without any usage of first party data, right? What is the incremental revenue? What is the incremental conversion that a channel is driving for me, right? And so this is the baseline for us. Is the media driving the sale or is that ad basically taking credit for a sale that was anyways going to happen? Now, uh, like I said, interesting uh, time researching for this article, right? So you see a bunch of images on the, on the, on the slide. So carrying on from uh, the attribution conversation, right? On the right-hand side is what you see um, as last touch attribution, last click attribution, or multi-touch attribution. So we started out with base models of last click and last touch, and now we've gone to a place where we're trying to get more advanced in terms of how we're measuring performance, right? The reason I picked up the football analogy is because it's the best way of explaining how credit is assigned. So if you have a Ronaldo or a Maguire who's scoring the goal, he's the last person to touch that ball before it hits the goal. Right? That person gets 100% of the credit, gets 100% of the accord, the recognition, everything. That is essentially what we're doing with our current models of measurement. Now this becomes a bit of a problem when you look at the channel mix. On the one hand, we are saying that omnichannel is important. Multi-channel is critical to how we're running businesses. We have an influx of D2C businesses, startups, entrepreneurs who are entering that space, who are present both offline and online and within online. That mix looks like this. Look at the number of channels that are in, in that path to conversion. Right? Look at the channels where we are allocating budgets. Um, I'm going to quote Airbnb here. I think Airbnb's uh, CMO made a very interesting statement. He said, the way that we run attribution today is essentially people are trying to slice that pie and say, okay, let's attribute credit to these many channels. But, but the pie remains the same. The objective of measurement, the objective of optimization is how do we increase that pie? To increase that pie that you see on the left-hand side, you have to have more robust methods of experimenting, more robust methods of optimizing campaigns. 
Now, this is where I, I have to say, you know, Medium, um, if you follow a Snap channel, Substack, um, some of these links, uh, if you are interested, I'll, I'll send them out to you. But this is a very interesting research done by uh, uh, three independent um, freelance marketing analysts and agency uh, guys. And what they've done is they've analyzed the top 40 uh, consumer brands and how are they running marketing analytics today. So if you see ASOS, Stitch Fix, Netflix, Uber, Airbnb, and many more such brands are running at least a combination of three measurement models. Right? There is marketing mix modeling, there is multi-touch attribution. They always start with multi-touch attribution, then move to MMMs, and then, more importantly, they're now getting into the space of what you see as CLS over there, custom lift studies. Experiments that tell you what is the incremental impact of a particular channel, and then going back and optimizing their campaigns, um, uh, optimizing their MMM models, optimizing their MTA models with these. So in our case, for example, with, with Epsilon, Urban Outfitters uh, is a massive brand for us, right? They spend approximately 30 million between publicists and Epsilon. They are leveraging our insights to optimize their MMM models. I want to specifically read out some of the statements that are being made, right? So Stitch Fix, which is a clothing uh, uh, apparel uh, retailer, has clearly said our North Star is incrementality. Everything we do is based off of randomized control trials. And I want you guys to retain that randomized control trials uh, in your mind, because that's what we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive in. And interestingly, for Netflix, usually we'd like to run a classic individual level randomized experiment. But randomizing which individuals see a billboard, as an example, is not possible. However, while we cannot randomly assign individuals, we can randomly choose some cities within which to show billboards and other cities to leave out, right? So you have custom lift studies, and then you have geo lift studies, and then you have the recognition from within a, a, a behemoth like Netflix that we can't do individual life, uh, level sort of control test, randomized control trials across the board. So we have to have a mix of measurement models. Going deeper into Randomized control trials. I'm just going to give you one reference point. 2020, Covishield versus Covaxin. Bharat versus Aadhaar Punawala, right? All of us overnight became experts at what is the ideal size of control group, yeah? Was the Bharat uh, Covishield control group uh, you know, sufficient, uh, statistically significant to prove efficacy? Go back to that. That's essentially what we're talking about when we say randomized control trials. Control group, test group, individuals randomly assigned to either control or test, and then measuring the difference in performance in conversion range between the two. But the starting point of a randomized control trial is a hypothesis. What am I trying to prove or disprove, right? So in our case, the hypothesis, whenever Epsilon works with a client, is if we build a campaign, right, where each ad is personalized to an individual, keeping that individual in mind, uh, delivered at a time when they're most likely to respond on a device that they're most likely to engage on, we will see a delta. That is our hypothesis. And sometimes our, our control um, test environments prove that there isn't a significant incremental uplift, the number that you saw for Mama Earth of 30.5%, right? But more often than not, you do see a delta. You see this hypothesis being proven that if you do one-to-one -one personalization, you do a segment of one communication through ads, display ads on the open web, you will see a delta in performance. You will see a delta in conversion rate. How does this pan out? This is the most simplistic way of representing a test and control environment. Right? On the left-hand side, you see this blank uh, image. That's the control group. And on the right-hand side is where we're running the test. The test where personalized, one-to-one, -one, dynamically rendered ad is being served. Right? The control group has some key important uh, you know, parameters. Control needs to be of a significant size that you, there, are, there are enough conversions in there that you can um, say this is scientifically valid as a result, that this is equivalent to what you would have on the test group side, right? Number one. Number two, you have to have individuals assigned to either control or test in a random fashion. Why is individual important? It cannot be uh, email IDs 
or I have multiple email IDs, I have multiple mobile numbers, right? um, or I have multiple cookies. Average touch point that we see in this market is anywhere between five to six. So would you assign one of my identifiers into control and then another one into, into test? That would basically contaminate the entire experiment. So that's why you need identity resolution, something that you saw in the Mama Earth case study, right? So identify individual customers, collapse all of their identi identifiers into one ID, and then randomly assign them into control or test. And for as long as we work with clients, for example, we've been working with clients for seven to eight years, that control remains always active. This is not the same as running an A-B test. This is not the same as running a holdout group. This is an actual always-on control test experiment, right? The third component to this control and test environment is that both have to be similar to each other and representative of the overall base of the customer. So you can't pick and choose, let me put my best performing customer, my high value customer base, my high CLV customer base into the test so I can up the number there. I can up the incremental conver uh, the conversion rate over there. That is where the randomization comes and that's where the equivalent of, pharma equivalent of this uh, you know, experiment comes into the picture. And what it also does is it takes in offline and online data. So you're able to show causality, cause and effect of this particular channel in isolation, both across in-store transactions and online tra uh, digital transactions. Right. So this is where the, the causation part of our, our, our topic today comes in. That if you want to show the impact that a channel has driven in isolation, you have to get a little more hardcore in terms of the measurement methodologies, the marketing analytics that you're running within organizations. Caveat, this is not something that is recommended for businesses that are already starting, uh, are just starting out. So if I were in a D2C conference today, I would say, hey, wait a while. You don't have that complex channel mix to warrant this kind of investment because this needs investment. The reason why most programmatic vendors don't offer incrementality testing right off the bat is because it needs data onboarding, it needs identity resolution, it needs those capabilities that typically a CDP vendor would talk to you about, and it needs very, very strong analytics capabilities. Right? And the last and most important piece to all of this is, like any scientific e experiment, right? that's why I've got scientific advertising, the book, up on the corner. Claude Hopkins ran the first randomized control trial in marketing in 1928. Right, is because it needs to be transparent and a marketer, an analytics head, needs to be able to replicate this. Every time somebody replicates this, that incremental conversion lift needs to come out as is the way we reported it. So we're not grading our own homework, we're saying you should be able to replicate this just like any other peer-reviewed trial or experiment out there. So if you guys are still with me, this is what replication looks like. This is what transparency looks like. This is what testing um, incrementality looks like. On the left-hand side, <clears throat> you see randomization. The fact that we're not gaming the system, the fact that we're not upping the number uh, of high-performing customers in the test group is on the left-hand side. So if you see, this is an actual uh, uh, analysis that our team did for one of our retail apparel retail clients you can see that the split of customers across test, which is the black gray box and orange, which is the control, is, is pretty similar, right? That's what we want to do. Control needs to be representative of the business, so does test need to be representative of the business as a whole and the customer base that the business works with. And on the right-hand side is, is the no bias component. We do not want to manipulate um, the data. We don't want to manipulate um, the, 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 the way that the impressions are getting served. So both in control and in test, ads are actually getting served. So in the previous slide, on the left-hand side, you saw this blank space, right? This is an actual ad being served. It's just that there is no personalization in this ad. There is no one-to-one -one communication dynamic creativeness with that. This is a brand neutral ad being served. This is the difference between A-B testing and, and holdout groups you're actually serving media both in control and in test. So now the right-hand side graph that you see, which is impressions served, right? The orange and black lines need to overlap. This is where we're saying that the frequency of communication to both the control and test environments is similar. We're not gaming the system. And these are the kind of test and health hygiene checks that our clients actually run, right? Hence the, 
you need to be a little bit more advanced in where your business is uh, before we get into this kind of analytics. Um, going back to identity, I think we covered this uh, briefly. Multiple email IDs, mobile numbers, especially in the Bharat side of our ecosystem where there's high churn rate in mobile numbers, right? And the kind of numbers that we are seeing with, with cookie churn, five to six average touch points per customer. This is where identity comes in, right? On the left-hand side is the data that the brand or the retailer knows. So since we're talking about Mama Earth, on the left-hand side is the transactional data, the customer data, the CRM data that they would be working with. On the right-hand side, I'll draw your attention to the device profile and the content consumption. This is what Epsilon adds to the equation. This gives you the single view of customer. So far, you have to go into a CDP implementation or a data lake or a data warehouse implementation, all of those three letter acronyms to get a single view of customer. We've taken that single view of customer SVOC and said 360 degree built into this programmatic solution. Why? Because that's the only way you can do personalization and prove the hypothesis that personalization in real time drives incremental conversions. Moving on. This is an interesting one, and I picked it up not to brag about the 10 to 1 IROAS that we delivered for, for Domino's, but mostly to prove that you have a necessity for identity. The reason Domino's worked with us was because high frequency, they have a very robust CRM. They have 30 million records in the UK market. But when they started working with Epsilon, they realized that about 30% of those records were duplicate. So how do you run an effective control test environment in-house, custom, if you don't have identity baked into the solution? 30% duplicate records, right? And with them, I think we've been working with them for about uh, four odd years. Um, it's, it's been a, a stable IROAS. All their ask from us is maintain the IROAS at a level where it's profitable for us. Now that IROAS number would change from business to business somewhere, you know, it needs to be a two to one for that, for that, for that channel to be profitable, for that ROI calculation to pan through, others it needs to be a little higher, right? It's a function of average order values, uh, frequency of purchase, and so it changes by um, vertical to vertical. Um, some of the other interesting metrics that um, that pan out when you've successfully proven that hypothesis of personalization, right? I'll draw your attention to the, to the first column over here. So this is an analysis from May 2019 to August 2020, so almost you know, a year plus. Attribution is limited in its window. It's limited to a seven day uh, today with third party cookie deprecation or 40 days at best because it has a high dependency on cookies, right? third-party cookies. Now, in the case of an identity-based programmatic solution, you're able to do analysis like this. May 2019 to August of 2020, you're able to onboard data and then retain that customer base. So 9% of that customer base was still reachable at the end of the analysis period. Right? What does this mean in terms of conversions, which is the second column? So while your um, uh, reach is 9%, you've been able to successfully identify, continue to identify these customers over the open web, you have successfully impacted the conversion rate. The conversion rate has seen a 5x growth. In the third column, you're able to see new to file customers. Now, because you can identify who your existing customers are, you're able to run more robust new customer acquisition programs. And the third one is the, the gold star for us, which is what our clients measure us on, IROAS, incremental return and ad spend. So while you have, a, you, you, you have this uh, decrease in the number, you have a significant increase in the incremental return and ad spend. So as an overall channel, over a 12-month period, 12-plus month period, you have been able to successfully increase that incremental return and ad spend. This again is an insight that um, is important from a test and control perspective. Why for large-scale businesses is important to run always on test and control? Because you can do analysis like this. On the one hand side, you have a new customer base analysis which says there is a 21% increase in you know, first purchase to second purchase between test customers where you're running personalization and a 19% uh, increase from first purchase to second purchase for those who are in the control group. A 2% at scale 
would mean significant monies, especially with the kind of volumes that we work in within the Indian market, right? So you have a new customer analysis. What is the impact of personalization on both existing customers and on new customers? And within existing customers, you see a similar result, right? 33% of existing customers purchase two plus times compared to 26% of, of control. All of this boils back down to running always on test and control, so you can do all kinds of permutation combinations, right? Um, in the case of certain advanced uh, scenarios, advanced retailers, uh, they're running MMMs that are being optimized on the back of these insights. They're running audience segmentation, audience programs to drive customers um, with specific creatives, dynamic treatments, etc. So there are various permutation combinations possible with insights like this. Um, and with that, I come to the end of this measurement session in the second half. Um, thank you for, for bearing with me. I'm going to wrap it up with a quote from um, George Box. So he said, all models are wrong, but some are more useful, right? So basically, depending upon where a business is, certain models will work more efficiently in those scenarios. Um, but uh, it's really what goal a business is, is taking on. If internally, our businesses are aligned to report click-throughs, our businesses are aligned to report easy-to-navigate dashboards, C-suite is able to understand clicks better than, say, incrementality or scientific experiments, that's what you're going to go with as a model, as a measurement and analytics exercise, right? But if you're, if you're moving um, towards profitability, if you're having a conversation internally around ROI, what is the incremental revenue that marketing is driving? What is the incremental revenue that a, a specific channel is driving? Then more advanced methods of uh, measurement need to be incorporated into the marketing analytics suite. Um, with that, um, in case you have any questions around uh, the reports, you need access to the URLs, I'll be available for the next two, three hours. And if you have any questions on the three-letter acronyms that platforms like ours talk about, CDP, DMP, DSP, SSP, MMP, uh, MMMs, MTAs, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. I will get you the free copy. Thank you so much.